to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. In this week's episode, we're going to look at several different news headlines in the health and wellness area from the past week. We look at whether you can live longer with a dog by your side. Next, we learn about orthorexia, what it is, and some ways to treat this disorder. And finally, we ask the question, does consuming a protein shake after an intense gym workout help, or are you just wasting your money? So we're going to look at three different studies answering each of these questions and examining each of these items that have recently been in the news. So the first study refers to whether or not owning a dog can help you live longer. So a study published Tuesday by the Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes, a peer-reviewed journal of the American Heart Association, says owning a dog is linked with living longer. Now, this study and meta-analysis looked at studies published from 1950 to May of 2019 that evaluated dog ownership and its association to mortality. So they looked at 10 different studies that yielded data from more than 3 million participants. So what they found was that dog owners were likely to live longer than those who didn't have dogs. Specifically, dog owners had a 24% risk reduction for death from any cause, according to the study. For people with heart problems, living with a dog had an even greater benefit. The study found that people who suffered a heart attack and lived alone were 33% less likely to die after being released from the hospital if they owned a dog. Meanwhile, for stroke victims, who were also dog owners, the risk of death was 27% lower. So the researchers concluded that the lower risk of death associated with dog ownership could be due to the increase in physical activity due to regular dog walks and the decrease in but potentially this could be much more important in a decrease in loneliness and depression that has been linked to dog ownership by previous studies. So obviously those who own a dog feel more of a sense of purpose with a dog present than not. One of the leading researchers indicated that dogs address multiple factors that contribute to cardiovascular diseases, including mental and physical health. So having a pet may assist a person in managing stress, increasing their activity and physical activity, and decreasing their isolation and any feelings of loneliness. By walking a dog 20 to 30 minutes a day, owners technically beat the American Heart Association's recommended weekly activity of 150 minutes of moderate exercise to improve overall cardiovascular health. And he warned, though, against people misinterpreting the study's results. So owning a dog does not overcome cardiovascular risk factors such as high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, and smoking. So you can't just say, hey, I'm going to get a dog and I'm going to smoke three packs a day doesn't really work that way. The best combination would be to have an active dog owner, but someone who also addresses and proactively addresses their any risk factors associated with potentially cardiovascular health. Now, it's also important to remember that dog ownership should not be taken lightly. You can't or shouldn't use dog ownership as, well, I want to try and live longer, so I'm going to get a dog. You, before rescuing and adopting a dog, and you should always adopt and rescue from a local area shelter. People should realize that all of the attention, the proper feeding, the walks, the medical care, all the responsibilities entailed in pet ownership are important to note and make sure that you are fully prepared for that responsibility of pet ownership. Also on the same topic, two new studies add to the existing evidence finding an association between dog ownership and a significantly lower death risk following a stroke or heart attack. And I'll link those in the show notes at www.fitterist.com slash 030 for episode 30. Now, I have two dogs in my family. I'm not sure if that further reduces any risk or adds to my stress given their antics and whatnot. Overall, I love them. They are awesome. They keep me active and they listen to me all the time. I don't know if they know what I'm saying, but they're a great sounding board. And now on to news story number two. I thought this story was a really interesting one. It's around when one's efforts to eat clean 
become a really unhealthy obsession. And it discusses orthorexia, which I personally had not really even heard of before. It's a relatively new thing, even though historically it was first referenced in a scientific study in 1997. But it's so orthorexia is still a relatively new condition that occurs when people become so fixated on the idea of eating clean or choosing only whole foods in their natural state that they end up impacting their physical and mental health. And sometimes this means missing critical nutrients or not even getting enough calories. And the article profiled a young gentleman who went from over 250 pounds at his heaviest down to about 140. And he went to the extreme measures of restrictive eating. So he essentially went down to 10 foods. And they actually detail what the 10 foods are that he lost the 110 pounds. So he went with spinach, chicken, egg whites, red peppers, spaghetti squash, asparagus, salmon, berries, unsweetened almond milk, and almond butter. That's it. 10 things. And over the period of time, over years, he eventually got down to 140, posted pictures of a six pack and his clean diet. And the problem was he was starving. He was tired and he was very lonely. So Part of the challenge here is he became afraid over time. He trained his body and his mind, more importantly, to become afraid of eating certain foods. He would do things like he'd work at home to avoid any office parties where he'd likely have to eat in front of others. So he was kind of ashamed of the 10 foods that he was eating. He didn't really go out because or make friends because he didn't want to have to explain his diet or try and carry food around or order if he could around that. I don't even know if he would trust restaurants in food preparation to make sure that there was no other oil on the grill where his food might be prepared. And so he ended up just doing nothing and staying basically at home most of the time. Orthorexia, it comes from the Greek word meaning right and appetite. But as we learn in the article, orthorexia is more a reflection on the larger scale of the cultural perspective on eating clean. And now coming from the bodybuilding world, I hear and talk about eating clean all the time. Now, it's not restrictive at all, down to 10 foods, but it's about avoiding processed foods, about avoiding sugar, oils, processed foods, things like that is where I kind of say eating cleanly. But obviously, this is a whole other level. So eating healthfully, avoiding toxins, including foods that might have any kind of superpower is what this group of people does. And the problem, though, is when you're so focused on your diet that it, as we saw with this gentleman, it begins to infringe on your quality of life. Your ability to be spontaneous, your ability to engage with other people in social activities, that's when you really start to have what these doctors would classify as a classic eating disorder called orthorexia. Now, orthorexia is different that it centers around eating cleanly and purely where many of the other eating disorders center around size and weight and drive for a particular thinness or weight. Anorexia being probably the most well-known eating disorder. Orthorexia is often considered just a part of other disorders too. So things like just broader eating disorders, OCD, general anxiety disorder. So what are some of the common symptoms of orthorexia? Well, one is a fixation over the quality of food. Again, not the quantity. It's really around the quality and purity of the food. And those individuals that suffer from orthorexia often focus on foods that are and only on foods that are organic, farm fresh, whole, raw, and or vegan. So the quantity of the food is typically less, far less important than the quality. Number two is when someone starts to cut out entire food groups. This is again a form of kind of extreme dieting where the rule-based diets become the norm where they eliminate the entire food groups. So the elimination of things like meat, all dairy products, all carbohydrates, all gluten, all processed foods, all sugar can be a symptom. The third symptom would be just the emotional wear and tear and the emotional challenges if the rules of the diet are broken. So if someone strays from their extremely rigid eating patterns or from their self-prescribed exercise regimen, the user suffers from severe anxiety, distress, shame, guilt, depression. All of these things can trigger any of the departures from this very limited, very restricted diet that is encompassed by these rules. If any of those are broken, it becomes emotionally challenging. 
A fourth symptom is just inflexible eating patterns. So usually someone with orthorexia is likely incredibly rigid with their food consumption. Anything considered bad or unhealthy will be avoided, even to the point where someone with orthorexia will choose to eat nothing than eat something even if they are extremely, extremely hungry. A fifth symptom is constant worry about sickness or disease. So back to the whole good versus bad foods. A lot of people with orthorexia believe that if they will become ill, that they will get cancer if they consume foods that are not whole or clean enough. And anything that deviates from their list is almost like poison. The risk of these foods causing sickness, diseases, even though scientifically it's unfounded, that risk far outweighs the desire to eat that specific food. And a sixth symptom would be anxiety, simply being around certain foods. So they might be in a social or work setting, but they might feel the need to separate themselves from any food that they see for fear that they might be tempted or they just get more uncomfortable. The challenge though is isolating is a common avoidance technique for those with orthorexia. They skip social events and they have fear foods that lead to intensified behaviors, ultimately leading to depression and withdrawal. So how does one kind of address orthorexia? So to address the condition, doctors really have to look at the psychological thought process and try to separate out the beliefs that one has about food. Because these beliefs become very entrenched over time. Think about it. It takes years for the gentleman in the article to drop from 250 to 140. And all throughout that period, he's reinforcing that these foods are the only good foods. All other foods equal poison or bad. So these beliefs become very entrenched. As an example, those affected need to understand that eating a slice of pizza will not cause the end of the world. It will not instantly cause cancer. But this process is a gradual one. It's a gradual learning process that allows one to start to reintroduce foods into this ultra-restrictive diet. Oftentimes, there can be just a stepwise process by which one might, as an example, order a frozen yogurt and get comfortable with the nutritional components of that before they might, down the road, decide to order an ice cream cone as they reintroduce certain foods in their diet. Roughly one in three people struggling with eating disorders is a male, according to the National Eating Disorders Association. So all these disorders affect athletes at a higher rate than the rest of the population. The drive to excel, the drive to perform, the drive to be your best as an athlete just amplifies most of these situations. So I don't know that I've ever personally seen anything quite as restrictive as the examples cited in this article, but I've definitely seen instances where one's diet limits their activities limits on social engagements. Now, I get it if you're a couple of weeks from stepping on stage at a competition and you want to dial it back and just relax since you're probably low on carbs and have no energy anyway. But I've also seen people who won't participate in a meal out with friends or family due to the restrictiveness of their diet. So orthorexia, it's an interesting phenomenon. It's relatively new. We'll see how the research progresses in treating this interesting, clean eating, healthy disorder. And now, in the news story number three. The story comes out of the UK. The University of Lincoln suggests that protein shakes are no more effective at rebuilding muscle and boosting recovery than high carbohydrate drinks after a workout. British researchers say that neither whey protein based shakes nor milk based shakes enhanced muscle recovery, or eased any soreness compared to a carbohydrate-only drink. Again, I'll provide the link to the full study in the show notes, but let's take a look at how this study was designed. So the study, which was published in the Journal of Human Kinetics, researchers recruited 30 males between the ages of 20 and 30. All the participants had at least a year's experience with resistance training prior to the study. So what they did is they took these 30 participants, divided them into three groups. Each group was assigned to consume either a whey hydrosolate drink, B, a milk drink, or C, a flavored carbohydrate drink after a prescribed intensive resistance training session. Now, after the workout, the participants were retested 
and asked to rate their levels of muscle soreness on a scale from zero, which is zero is no muscle soreness, to 200, which is muscle soreness as bad as it could possibly be. And the researchers also asked the participants to complete a series of strength and power assessments, including throwing a medicine ball while seated and jumping as high as possible from a squatted position. At the start of the study, all of the participants, all of the 30 participants, again, age range 20 to 30, rated their muscle soreness between 19 and 26, all of them essentially very, very low. Then they reassessed those measurements 24 and 48 hours after the weightlifting session. Now, this is a phenomenon called delayed onset muscle soreness, DOMS, D-O-M-S. All the participants rated their soreness above a 90, which is high, but still on the scale provided, less than half on a scale of 0 to 200. What's more, in the physical assessments, the participants showed reductions in the muscle power and function. Not surprising because you're tired, you just worked out. However, there was no difference in recovery response and soreness scores between the three different groups. Thus, the researchers that conducted the study concluded that there is no additional benefit in consuming protein shakes or drinks for the sake of muscle recovery. One of the reasons this study actually made the news this week is because it contradicts a fair amount of previous research which has shown that protein can ease soreness, protein can speed up recovery, and protein does help repair the muscles that are torn during resistance training or weightlifting. Given this is contrary to this common gym post-workout nutrition guidance, let's dive into just a couple areas of the study in a little more detail. So first, it's a relatively small study, 30 participants total. And again, age range is 20 to 30, but only 30 people. The second potential flaw with this is the lack of a control group. So it was great that they parsed out the three groups to consume one of three beverages. There was actually no control group that just drank something like water or drank nothing. So you had A versus B versus C, but you had no control group that was kind of the, you know, a control group, which is why you have a control group for a study. A third item is the subjectivity of the user's soreness ranking. This is a tough one because anytime you ask research participants to gauge a certain level, it's very difficult for them to do so accurately and consistently. Now, when you expand the scale on a scale of one, zero to 200, now it's one thing if you're like, hey, rate this one to five, five you liked it, one you didn't like it. It's relatively easy for someone to do that. But now you're measuring muscle soreness, which is rarely rated in one's mind, and then spread it out over a scale from zero to 200. That's a pretty detailed scale to gauge a specific soreness level. So there's some room there for ambiguity. The fourth item with regard to this study is that the recovery and repair of muscles doesn't necessarily just come down to protein. You have to consider the type of workout, the rest, the hydration, the overall nutrition, which makes it very complicated to link, to simplify something to just protein for repair and recovery. Muscle repair and rebuilding actually requires both protein and carbohydrates. So protein helps restore the muscle and build strength while carbohydrates refurbish the glycogen levels in the body. And glycogen is a substance that's stored in the muscles and used by the body for energy. Personally, I drink a protein shake with a mixed carbohydrate source. So I probably get around 40 grams of protein and maybe 30 grams of carbs mixed into my post-workout shake. I just kind of find it interesting overall that the headline from a study cannot necessarily be taken at face value. You have to dive into the details. It's best to understand a little more of the detail, how the research or experiment was conducted before drawing any real deep conclusions or certainly making any changes to your own nutrition plan. Again, in this case, the conclusion reached is technically legitimate, but there are several non-trivial factors that should signal a red flag with regard to the study conclusion. So the moral of the story, always do your own homework. That concludes this week on The Fitter Show. We'll be back next week with more exciting stories in the news, and other wellness and health and fitness topics. We'll see you then. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterist Show. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitterist Mind Body and on Twitter at Fitterist Mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend or subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes of The Fitterist Show. My name is Christopher Allen and make it a magical day.